Guru Lasset is a student on the clinical program and is also a junior neuroscientist. She is part of the hedonic pharm pharmacology, pharmacology <laughs> lab. I know this word, I promise. The hedonic pharmacology lab and has spent a good part of the last year and a half studying how endorphins are in involved in our social behaviors. Um, in December, she published published a review of our article on the topic, and tonight she'll ta talk about how endorphins tweak the social brain and can make us feel better and less, or less bad. But um, before that, Guru was, is, a journalist and is the main instigator of Oslo Psych Science. Thanks for raising the bar for me. <laughs> <laughs> so she needs a really big applause. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right, I'll try and live up to that. Right, so I'd like you all to imagine that it's Friday night and you're on your sofa at home, worn out from the week, and imagine that you're alone and you're feeling a little lonely. What to do? Should you go out or should you stay in? Despite feeling a little tired, you call a friend and arrange to meet up somewhere, because it would just be nice to see someone. You drag yourself away from the sofa and almost regret it until you see your friend smiling at you. You're feeling better already. At the end of the night, you feel slightly euphoric from good conversation and good fun. How could you ever have even considered staying in? As a social neuroscientist, I am dying to know exactly what's going on in your brain while you're doing and feeling all of this. How does the motivation to be social arise on a neurobiological level? So far, I've been studying the role of the brain's opioid system which uses endorphins as neurotransmitters. Endorphin is the morphine produced by our own brains and involved in regulating experiences of pain and pleasure. When we're in pain, endorphins can activate the pain gateways of our brainstem and turn down the intensity of the pain signal so we feel less bad. And then when we engage in something pleasant instead, like eating chocolate, Endorphin release is related to feelings of happiness and satisfaction. It seems that endorphins paint a hedonic gloss over the stuff that we find rewarding, which helps us direct our efforts towards the most valuable rewards. Now, for a social animal, being social can be immensely rewarding. From studies in rats and monkeys, we know that endorphins are released during social play and social grooming. This is taught, thought to create positive social feelings and strong emotional bonds, making endorphins act as a neurobiological social glue. Uh, endorphins also seem to mark the relationships that are more valuable to us. If endorphins are blocked, otherwise monogamous rodents will get not get attached to their partner. And mouse pup that lack, lack the endorphin receptor gene altogether won't develop any attachment to their mother. So the ability to experience endorphin-mediated reward from social stimuli appears to be necessary for social attachment to occur. According to an early theory, the endorphin feel-good effect is what makes us seek social contact to begin with. And being without, without it is like being in opioid withdrawal. Loving, loving someone is a bit like being addicted, according to this theory, because being with them releases endorphins in our brains. So if we take opioid drugs instead, this can play, replace the uh, desire for social contact. Now, lots of evidence from animal research initially seemed to support this theory. For instance, when infants are separated from social contact, they start crying to get attention or comfort from others. Now, if you activate their opioid system with a little extra small dose of morphine instead, they calm down just like they would if their mum was there. But if you block the system with a kind of anti-drug, they just cry harder. The same was found in studies of adult monkeys. If their opiate system had been blocked, they seemed even more desperate to interact with the others. If given morphine instead, they were less social, as if getting their endorphin fix from morphine diminished their social motivation. Now, here comes the paradox. In rats, the pattern was completely reversed. Morphine increased their social motivation and made them more social. When the system was blocked, this showed less interest in social interaction, as if the fun had been taken out of it. 
Now, I was struggling to understand what this paradox actually meant. Why didn't morphine replace the need to be social for rats as it did with primates? Are the brains of rats and monkeys really that different, or was something else going on that could explain all this? I went through the literature again and found that the clue was in the context. In all the studies, the animals had been socially isolated. And I think the key difference between monkeys and rats is actually how they feel about this isolation. The monkeys did not appreciate it. And even the grown-ups got stressed out. So their endorphin systems were busy regulating negative feelings. Monkeys are social animals that depend on their group for survival. So being isolated is really aversive. A social contact signals safety. But if they had already been given morphine, the need for that safety and the social endorphins was not so great anymore because the stress had already been reduced. Rats, on the other hand, are just fine being alone. So in the experiments with social isolation, they didn't get that distressed, so they didn't need the endorphins to regulate the negative feelings. Instead, they could benefit from the other positive aspect of endorphins, the pleasure-enhancing effects. Now, we have made a model to try and explain all this. When an animal is distressed, <laughs> like the isolated monkeys, it is motivated to seek social, positive social interactions that will release endorphins and make them feel less bad. The result is a calmer animal that no longer seeks out social contact for comfort. But when the animal is in a state of comfort already, like the rats were, it is instead motivated to seek out social contact for fun, to maintain friendships, or perhaps find a mate. And in this context, endorphin release will increase social exploration, perhaps by improving confidence. Now, I'd like you all to think back to the scenario when you went on the sofa, debating whether or not to go out. Were you motivated to see your friend because you needed a shoulder to cry on? Or were you motivated to see her because you wanted to have a laugh? Regardless of starting point, your behavior was the same. You went out to see your friend. And your opioid system probably played a role either way, either recruiting endorphins in brain areas that are associated with pleasure enhancement or with pain regulation, so that you could feel even better or just less bad. And that was all for me. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs>